Hey everybody, Dr. Phil here. So this is going to be a brief video on one sample uh, tests of hypotheses. All right, so by way of, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the background here. So we continue to apply statistics and statistical inference. Uh, remember inference, the idea of what? The idea of making educated guesses based on a sample regarding a population. Um, so we're doing this for the research process, right? In the research process, we often start with a hypothetical statement. Then we define a population to sample, collect data on the variables of interest, and then conduct statistical analysis. This analysis performs statistical tests of the hypothesis using the sample data. The results of the analysis provide the evidence used to make inferences about the population. So what is very simply, like in a nutshell, what is hypothesis testing? So a hypothesis is a statement about a population parameter that is subject to verification. So it's basically something we're saying that we don't know if it's true. The whole point is to try to figure out if it is or not. So what would we do? We would select the sample data, use the statistics to conduct the hypothesis test. Based on sample evidence, we'll decide to reject or fail to reject the statement. Hypothesis testing, we can think of this as a procedure based on sample evidence and probability theory to determine whether the hypothesis is indeed a reasonable statement. So there's really a six-step procedure for testing a hypothesis. And this, is, this isn't just in business, this is in research the world over, in any subject. So procedure that systematizes hypothesis testing. At step six, we interpret the results based on the decision to reject or not reject the hypothesis. No proof uh, something like this is true, but proof beyond a reasonable doubt, kind of like a court. So if you look at step one, we're going to state the null and alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is there's no change. The alternative hypothesis is there is some kind of change. Step two is select a level of significance. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Step three is identify the test statistic. Step four is formulate a decision rule. Step five is take a sample and arrive at decision. And then step six is interpret the results. So step one, state the null and alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is a statement about the value of a population parameter developed for the purpose of testing numerical evidence. We typically denote this H um, sub subscript zero. So the subscript of this, this just is a, denotes no change. So if sample data provide convincing evidence it's false, then the null hypothesis, i.e. no change, would be rejected. So then it's like saying there is, there, we actually, there is a change. Otherwise, we'll just reject the null hypothesis. And then alternative hypothesis, or the alternate hypothesis, a statement that is accepted if the sample data provides sufficient evidence that the null hypothesis is false. So this we denote H sub 1. So this is the research hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is, um, is indeed rejected, we conclude the alternative is supported by the sample data. The equal sign will not appear in the alternative. Now, what about step two? Select a level of significance. So the level of significance is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. So due to sampling, there is a risk the sample indicates the null is false when it's true. So this is the probability. So this little, um, it looks like a little alpha. Uh, this, den this denotes the probability of this error. Okay. Um, and this is in, in statistics, statistics, we just, in parametric statistics anyway, we just call this alpha. It's kind of like the significance level. Um, so we always determine this error before proceeding. Traditionally, um, 0 0.01 or like 1%, 0 0.05, 5%, 0.1, 10%. You, you, there isn't really like a, a requirement that you have to use any certain alpha level. Um, I will tell you when I write papers, I almost always use a significance level. When I, when I publish research of um, 5%, that's pretty normal. Most people would say 5% is what they would use. All right, step three, select the test statistic. So this is a value determined from sample information used to determine whether to reject the null hypothesis. So when testing a mean, when uh, this is this little sign here is sigma, sigma is known, then the Z equals, this is X bar um, minus, uh, this is lambda, and then over sigma over the square root of N. And why do we use this? Because of the, if you remember from a previous video, the central limit theorem, right? Remember the, the central limit theorem, the idea that the bigger, um, the bigger the sample, uh, the more 
approaching uh, the normal distribution it will be. The number of standard errors that separate the sample and population values, of course, um, and we want to determine the probabilities the sample mean is within a specified number of standard errors. All right, step four, formulate the decision rule. So the critical value, this is the dividing point between the region where the null hypothesis is rejected and the region where it's not rejected. So you can see here um, the probability, if we're saying the probability is 0.95, we're basically saying we have a alpha uh, or a significance level of 0.05. We're saying that if it falls within pretty much this 95% range here, then we will not reject the null hypothesis. But if it falls over in this little area here, this little pr probability area over here, the 5%, um, then that's where we would re we would reject the null hypothesis, and thus we are accepting the um, research or the alternate hypothesis. All right, step five, make a decision. So compute the value of the test statistic, compare it to the critical value, and then make a decision. So if we reject, um, it's improbable this test statistic is large due to sampling error. If we fail to reject, then a this of course is H0. Think about that null hypothesis, right? H sub zero. A small test statistic is attributed to sampling error. So it is possible because of this, it is possible to make one what we call in statistics and research, we call these type one and type two errors. So type one error, this is rejecting the null hypothesis. Remember H sub zero when it's actually true. Um, and then type two error is not rejecting the null hypothesis when it turns out to actually be false. So we can think of this alpha, the significance level, remember that 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.1 that we talked about before. We can think of that alpha, the alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error, and thus we could say beta B is the probability of making a type 2 error. So if we see here, we've got the null hypothesis, we've got the researcher does not reject H sub 0, and then the researcher rejects H sub 0. Now remember H sub 0, that's just your null hypothesis. So if if H sub zero, the null hypothesis is true, and the researcher does not reject, then the correct decision. But if it does reject, then that represents a type one error. If the null hypothesis um, is H sub zero is false, and the researcher does not reject it, then the researcher has um, basically committed a type two error. But if it's false and the researcher rejects, then the researcher has made the correct decision. And then finally, step six, interpret the results. So what can we say or report based on the results of the statistical test? All right, so that's a little bit about the uh, kind of the six steps of research, if you will. The next thing we talk about is the one-tailed and two-tailed hypothesis tests. So you can see here, we've got the probability 0.95. We've got the region of re kind of region of rejection we talked about before. Um, so this is an example of what we call a one-tailed test. So think about the tails as in like either sides, uh, where it kind of approaches the x-axis of that normal distribution. Um, this is just a one-tailed test because we're just looking at this one side. Okay, so the rejection region, as it says, is only in one tail, which is in the right-hand side. So this corresponds to, in this case, greater than in the alternative. So the rejection region, what about if it's only in the left tail? So then this would correspond to less than in the alternative. And you see how, if I go back real quick, see how we have the 1.645 critical value here. This is, that's a, that's an F value. Then you notice here it's negative 1.65. We're just really talking about how many um, standard deviations are we away from the mean. So if it falls under that 1.65 value, then that would represent the rejection region if we were talking about uh, the hypothesis involves sort of a, like a less than scenario. Now, if it's two tailed, then the rejection region is both tails. So this corresponds to, I don't know if you've seen the sign before, this kind of, you think about what this means, right? An equal sign that's crossed out just means it's what? It's not equal to. So this corresponds to a not equal to in the alternative. So here you can see we've got the uh, rejection region, 0 0.025. And you notice how it's less than a critical value of negative 1.96 on the left-hand side. But if you look at the right-hand side, it's now positive 1.96. And the rejection region is now, of course, because we're just talking about the area, right? So it's 0.025. Um, so it's got to be either, it's got to be less than point, the, the, as far as the surpassing that critical value, what we call F crit, 
It's got to be less than 1, negative 1 1.96, or above uh, 1.96 with respect to that Z scale. So let's look at a quick example. So, James Hand Steel Company manufactures and assembles desks and other office equipment at several plants in New York State. At the Fredonia plant, the weekly production of the model A325 desk follows a normal distribution with a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 16. New production methods have been introduced and the, and the VP of manufacturing would like to investigate whether there has been a change in weekly production of the model A325. So is the mean number of desks produced different from 200 at the 0.01 significance level? So we're using a very, a very high significance level here. So here's what we do. We, actually, we can actually just kind of plug this in. Um, so remember H sub zero, this is what? This is our null hypothesis. So we're saying that the mean equals 200, like there's, you, there's no change, versus H1, which is the research hypothesis, which says that the mean is not equal to 200. So null hypothesis, mean equals 200. Research hypothesis, H sub 1, mean is, is not equal to 200. So at step 2, we said we'd use an alpha of 0 0.01, basically 1%. And then step, step three is where we're going to use, we're going to figure out our basically our z-score, z-formula, if you will. And then look at what we've done down here in the chart. So you can see here, we have a critical value of 2.576. Okay, and I put the calculations are down here for you. And you can see that if it's, it's got to be above, think about it like this, right? It's got the scale of the z's got to be above 2.576, right? To fall into this rejection region where we can reject the null hypothesis. Um, or because this is two-tailed, right? If you look back at this um, research hypothesis, we again you've got the um, you've got the x the equal sign, right, with a with a little slash or line through it, which means it's not equal. It's not equal to or equal then. So well, this is a two-tailed um, test. So you can see we've got the instead of positive two point five seven six on the right, we've got negative two point five seven six on the left. So it's got a, the, the 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 critical value has got to be either above two point five seven six or below negative 2.576. If it falls in any of this region here, then this is where we would accept the null hypothesis, okay? And this is outside of here in these very little, if you look at the shaded kind of like bluey, grayish, I'm gonna go with grayish kind of areas here, that's where we would reject the null hypothesis and thus accept the research or alternate hypothesis. All right, so we plug in the numbers and we get what? We get 1.547. So then we say, all right, well, what is what, where does that fall in respect to the range? 1.547 is, of course, between negative 2.576 and positive 2.5760, right? So in this case, we do not reject um, the null hypothesis. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we, did, we did not show that the population mean has changed from 200 desks per week. The difference between the population mean of 200 per week and the sample mean of 203.5 could actually be just due to chance, or it could be to do with something else that we, we haven't studied here. The sample information fails to indicate that the new production methods resulted in a change in the 200 desks per week production rate. So in failing to reject the null hypothesis, did we prove that the assembly rate is still 200 per week? And the answer is absolutely conclusively Definitively, no. We did not prove it was true. The result does not support any conclusion about the null hypothesis, right? The sample data simply do not support the alternate hypothesis. Okay, so we could, in theory, use a if we wanted to, we could use a confidence interval approach. That would be another way of kind of doing this. So, for example, if the if the interval captured two hundred, do not reject um, H sub zero, the null hypothesis. The re the really kind of the big takeaway here is. Um, it's again, I mentioned this in another video, like correlation versus causality. You want to be very careful when you're conducting research to say something something caused or something is proved because that's often a stretch. Um, a lot, think about how many studies have been done and then it turns out that somebody else comes along and refutes the you know prior work, prior study. So the previous example demonstrated a two-tailed test to determine if the mean differed from 200, as you can see down here. We could have tested to see if there was an increase, in which case our, if we look at our null hypothesis, it just says H is, what is this, less than or equal to 200. So obviously then H sub 1, the researcher or alternate hypothesis is saying that the mean is greater than 200, right? So this is kind of the, this is the one on the right hand side, right? We're just looking at the right hand side. We've, we've kind of gone back to this like one tailed 
kind of thing where we're just looking at if it's greater than it's just going to be this one tailed on the right here if it's less than it would just be on the left this of course in the the left of these two diagrams the two-tailed test represents where it's it's an inequality right so it could be greater than or it could be less than so the critical value approach provides a good description of this procedure all right so one other thing i want to make sure we talk about just really quickly in this video is what we call the p-value so the p-value the best way to describe this is the probability of observing a sample value as extreme as or even more extreme than the value observed given that the null hypothesis is true. So the p-value is less than, if it's less than alpha, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than alpha, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. So remember, if we reject the null hypothesis, we're accepting the research or the alternate null hypothesis, right? If we do not reject the null hypothesis, um, then we're basically accepting it, then we are rejecting the research hypothesis. So p-value also gives additional insight about the strength of that decision. So if the p-value is less than 0 0.10, there is some evidence, um, like h sub 0, the null hypothesis is not true. If we're at the 5% level, 0 0.05, we have strong evidence. The 0 0.05 is the alpha significance level that most of us in research use. And then 0 0.01 would be very strong evidence. And then 0 0.001 would be extremely strong evidence. Good luck getting a 0 0.0. I think the best I've ever had in a research study or a paper was point. I've had point oh one. I don't recall ever having point zero zero one. That would be that would be quite a finding. So, for example, the the p value of point oh six zero is greater than uh, zero point zero one, as we can see uh, from the chart below. All right. Thanks as always for watching, and I will see you all in a future video.